It's time for the BallQuest Mailbag Podcast, answering your questions from the General's Quarters every week, right here on BallQuest. Good Thursday, everyone. Welcome to the BallQuest.com Mailbag Podcast, presented by Smoky Mountain Organics. He's Tennessee's most trusted health and wellness store focusing on natural products and organic remedies. That's Smoky Mountain Organics. You can check them out online at SmokyMountainOrganics.com or visit one of their four locations to serve you. They've got one in Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge, Sevierville. They've got the location in Knoxville at 8018 Kingston Pike, just down from Trader Joe's on the opposite side of the street. They've got all the latest and bath and body care items, organic teas, uh, plant therapy, essential oils, all those things that you need at Smoky Mountain Organics for your health and wellness. With Austin Price and Rob Lewis, I'm Brent Hubbs. Glad to have you along with us on this mailbag edition. And guys, we'll jump right into it. Obviously, there's a lot of recruiting questions in here. There's some stuff going on uh, people want to know about regards to the coaching carousel. We'll do our best to answer all those. A lot of good things in this mailbag edition of the podcast. So we'll get started with all vol recruiting who wants to know what are Tennessee's chances with uh, defensive lineman Vic Burley in the 23 class after another visit? Where does Tennessee stand with 2024 defensive lineman Alex Cunningham, Brown Schuler, and Justin Green? Austin, I know you're working some on the 22s. I know you're working on the 23s and 24s. Uh, I'll take the 23 and Vic Burley. I no, think, no, 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 no. I'm on no. that one. <laughs> I'm on that one, Austin. I think the getting getting him back up here for another visit is a positive. I think Tennessee is in uh, for early on. I think Tennessee has certainly put themselves uh, dead in the middle of that one. And I think Rodney Garner will have Tennessee in the middle of that one uh, to the finish line. Um, he, he's a young man out of South Georgia. As for Cunningham, Brown, Schuler, and Green, let's be honest, <laughs> Austin. I mean, it, it's they're trying to figure out who a top 10 is right now. AP, Tennessee's going to swing there. Hey, Keith, before we move on, can you just run down your what, what you think are the top 20, 25 guys on the board in 24? I shake my head, man. I shake my head at it all. I mean, they'll be, I mean, they'll, they'll swing and try to be in it, but those guys don't. It, it doesn't they matter. I mean, I think, right. I mean, all, all jokes aside, Tony Mitchell committed to Tennessee as an eighth grader going into his freshman year and has been committed to 14 different schools since then. Right. And right. so, like, I mean, you know, until they get to be juniors, it, it's hard to realistically look at anything. I, I'll unless they're quarterbacks all day long. Right. Unless they're a quarterback, that might be a little different if they're a quarterback situation there. But you're exactly right. I mean, it, it, it changes dramatically um, and will continue to because of kids interest change, coaching carousel and, and everything else that takes place there. All right. Brooks 1972 wants to know with the new donation ticket pricing plan uh, that's attempted to eliminate grandfathering tickets, side deals, freebies, et cetera, being implemented by the athletic department, has there been much pushback from the uh, Blue Bloods? Do you foresee it causing an increase, decrease in season ticket sales for football and basketball? Real simple, Rob, if you win, it, I mean, it doesn't affect anything, right? For the most that's, part. I mean, that's what I think. I mean, I, maybe oversimplifying it, but if you win, if you put a product out there that people want to see, the demand's going to be there. I mean, if you, if you don't, I mean, what was, However, you're, you're, you're always great at this. I mean, what were the season tickets for football like after Butch's last year? I mean, it was – it wasn't – it was low 60s. Yeah. I mean, and, and obviously and it, it's dropped in there. They're, they're in the Pruitt run as well. I mean, Butch had a year where they had over 70,000 season tickets sold heading into that 2016 season. Uh, win, winning counts. Um, there's no, I, I thought there was a great thread on the board earlier this week uh, with some guys talking about this. And, and I saw some people who said their, their prices went down. I saw, saw some other people who said theirs went up. So they decided to go one less ticket or two less tickets than what they had previously gotten. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I think there are going to be options out there for anybody that wants to renew that can keep their ticket at the same price point or very close to it. They might have to move in the stadium somewhere. Um, we'll see. I, I think I mean, the interesting one's going to be basketball, Rob. I agree, and that and to and and, it, and it, the basketball thing to me has been untenable for a long time. I mean, I know a lot of people, a lot of people. I mean, from when I was a little kid, 
whose parents bought those tickets. And even when I'm 12, 13 years old, I'm like, man, that's, that seems too good to be true. <laughs> you know? And, and those, it was. <laughs> and, and those people have had those tickets for 30, 35 years now. And I just, I mean, I, I just think it's, I, I understand why people that have those tickets are upset, but my God, I mean, it's just an ultimate expression of common sense to do what Danny White has done. I mean, it's just, it's, it's not sustainable if you want, you know, in a revenue sport like that, just give away that much stuff for free. Yeah. I, I think football ticket season tickets are going to ultimately increase for next year, Austin, because of the offense and the way Tennessee played this year, they bring everything back. There's an excitement level there. If Hendon hookers back, I think people are going to want to buy tickets. Um, and, and so I think, I, huh? I, was gonna say, I think Hendon and, and Cedric Tillman are both returning. Yeah. If you, if you had to meet a handicap it right now, I would say, I would, I would give it 75 or 80 percent, if not more, of both coming back. Which, again, will excite some people to buy season yes, tickets. Which, which sure. backs up your point. Yeah. Uh, let's go to C. Trout. Uh, C. Trout M1. Got a question about Heupel's recruiting philosophy. Do you know how much he values a recruit's cultural fit? In other words, if you've got one recruit who's very talented yet has a terrible attitude, would Heupel pursue them over someone with less talent but better character? You want to jump first. Ultimately, you're wanting, but you're wanting a kid with high character that is a stud on the field. Um, I, I think that that you know, I'm not saying that Tennessee wouldn't recruit somebody that's got some baggage because I think that they would, but I think it's got to be the right kind of fit, the right kind of person, and and you know, what kind of baggage do they have? Is this baggage that you know they've grown from and and they're in a better place now, or is this something where they're constantly getting in trouble? And I don't think Tennessee wants players that are constantly in the doghouse getting in trouble. Yeah. But I, I, how I, good they are. I mean, there's a difference between like a 17 year old making a mistake and maybe, you know, getting in the justice system somehow because he was made just an immature decision or a repetitive Friday action night, as opposed to, you know, somebody that beat up a girlfriend. Or, or a guy that went in and, and, you know, the coach said, yeah, he had some issues, but he's continued to have some of those issues as Austin mentioned, you know, repetitive deal. I mean, that, that's why, you know, that's why you have the, the in-home visits and the coaching visits. I mean, at the end of the day, Austin, your, one of your favorite lines is, is the juice worth the squeeze. And I think when you're talking about guys, when there is some character concerns there, that's what you have to look like, look at. I mean, difference maker, you know, and can you, can you manage whatever he's been through? Or is it one of those deals where the, the guy's not talented enough that you even want to pursue that road? And, and I think that's what all coaches look like. And, I think you talk to any coach out there, Rob, the character thing is more important now than it was e even 10 or 15 years ago because of the scrutiny of social media. Exactly. One, I was going to say that. The, the other thing, too, is the, the specialized training of players out there and development of guys. There's a larger pool of kids to pick from who are talented enough to play in your program than there were 15 or 20 years ago, in my opinion. I, I completely agree on both points. And I was going to bring up the social media point. Like you can't, you can't sweep stuff under the rug like you could 20 years ago. I mean, me and you both have heard tons of stories about, you know, man, I'm not saying guys should have gone to jail, but guys would have missed a game or two for suspension had, you know, things been out on social media. Um, and you just can't hide that stuff anymore. And I, I think that, heightens it just like you said because of the scrutiny i think there are more kids out there and i i don't think any coach at a you know unless they're desperate you know, like their backs against the wall they're not taking those kind of kids any, anymore well and here's i mean the social media thing is this week or the last couple of weeks has been a should have been a huge reminder to everybody i mean you got the you got the the texas defensive line coach you know, um, going bananas on the bus, you know, obviously that, that got out on social media. And Bo then, Davis, baby. Yeah, Bo, Bo Davis. Davis. And, and then on, on Wednesday, I mean, Brian Kelly's entire speech to his football team in the 7 a.m. meeting at Notre Dame is, is online. You, you, can, you can watch it. Now, he didn't say anything derogatory, but, I mean, there's nothing in a meeting or nothing anywhere that's, quote, sacred. I mean, that, that's the thing coaches should always remember. Players should – everybody should always remember that point because it's just – you're reminded of it routinely every day uh, when, when you deal with social media stuff out there. Uh, Alexander F. wants to know, who are some of the recruits' commits that you expect to outplay their rankings or should be ranked higher than their rankings suggest? Austin, one of these guys that we, you and I have talked about is, is, is Joseph's, right? 
Yeah, Joshua Josephs is better than what Rivals has him ranked. You know, I mean, you know, I I I can look at all the rankings, two four seven on three Rivals. You know, and I can you know, I mean, I can give my opinion of some guys that are overranked by one or underranked by one. You know, I mean, I, I do think that that Joshua Josephs is underranked by Rivals. Now, Caleb Webb. I don't know. I've not watched enough of him. I mean, I've seen stuff, but I mean, I've not watched enough of him to get a real feel for, you know, is he, is he underranked or not? Um, you know, I, I do think that some of these players that, that Tennessee, you know, is in on down the stretch here have a, uh, have a nice upside to them. And, uh, you know, I, I just feel like, you know, can Tennessee close it all, you know, with defensive linemen, whether that's getting back in on Walter, Jeffrey Umba, you know, I mean, like Tennessee needs linemen and they need, and they need guys that can play at strong side defensive end spot, you know, Tyler bear. And I could see him flipping around to strong side defensive end next year hubs, um, you know, but they need other guys that can, that can fill those certain roles. I, I mean, speak, I don't know as well as AP does, but just from watching huddle tape and, and seeing how Heupel plays offense this year, I like the Dylan Sampson kid and the, and, and the squirrel. I, I would be surprised if he doesn't turn them into some weapons. Yeah, speaking of the squirrel, that's a part of the next group of questions we got here. Uh, one, does Tennessee survive all the UGA interest for Squirrel White thanks to all the new wide receivers going into the transfer portal? I think that's interesting, Austin. Georgia likes Squirrel White, but Hazelwood's in the portal, a Georgia native. There's a lot of other receivers that have jumped in the portal this week, a couple of them from Oklahoma, obviously, Hazelwood and the other kid. Does that help Tennessee's chances – with a guy like Squirrel White, do you think Georgia looks at some of those guys and maybe trades up, sees a better guy who's got multiple year of eligibility in the transfer portal versus a Squirrel White? Potentially, but I also think that, you know, there are some people around Squirrel that are still pushing Tennessee that like, you know, Squirrel's ability in, in, in Heupel's offense. Um, so I don't think it's some slam dunk that, you know, if Georgia makes a push that he's just going to go all swoon and fall – fall into their laps. Um, I, I think that there's people that are still pushing Tennessee behind the scenes for squirrel. And so we'll see how it plays out. You know, Tennessee um, should be going in there, I believe, Sunday night. They're going in later this week, but then I think they're turning around because the week resets and then go in Sunday night with Heupel uh, for kind of that last big push before the, the final weekend. All right. Uh, his second question, chances with Tyree West, you still feel like that's Florida State. Well, like right now I do. Him, right, right now I do. You've got to, you've got to, you got to get him to campus next weekend. You know, can you avoid him pulling the trigger and then shutting it down after visiting at Florida State this weekend? Um, if you do that, if he gets to campus, then I think all bets are off because I think Rodney's done a nice job of, you know, creating some doubt there. And don't forget about the fact that you know he works out for Chuck Smith. You know, Chuck, Chuck's a diehard Vol. Die hard ball and uh, and 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 nobody nobody does an interview in front of the bus line at Neyland Stadium like Chuck Smith. No, but he does love his Tennessee team. There's no question in, in that program. Um, Walter Nolan, any chance at all considering he's visiting this weekend? Do you think the A and M shine is starting to wear off, even though he's committed? Um, listen, no, I don't I think mean, his head's wearing off. Go ahead. Th th there's a reason that like. I, I have kind of stayed back on this recruitment. Like, you know, you, you everybody knows, <laughs> they'll have to call me Uncle Austin or whatever. I'll, I'll be right in the middle of some of these. I've stayed back on this one because I, could, I couldn't handle this roller coaster. I'd be throwing up every weekend with all the, the, the back and forth and the twists and turns and stuff. Who knows? Hubs, who knows? He may not even sign early, Hubs. You just yeah. never know with this kid. I mean, uh, like, he doesn't, he's not an early enrollee. Right. So, I mean, and look, it, it would not surprise. I mean, he's going to be at Tennessee this weekend or Saturday, Sunday, Monday for his official visit. I think. I don't think there's anything going to change there. I, he's I, at, I think. I think he. I believe he'll make that visit. It would not shock me if he was at Texas A&M next weekend. No, nope. wouldn't surprise not me at all. Least. And it wouldn't surprise me if he does sign, and it, and it wouldn't surprise me if he doesn't sign in December. Nothing with that one is going to count until the ink is dry on the paper. Uh, and everybody who's supposed to sign the paper has signed the paper. Uh, that, that's the bottom line with that one. All right, his last question, do we get back in the race for the DB, uh, Prycrock from out west? That's Ephesians, right, AP? Yep, Ephesians, Prysock. Um, 
Yeah, it doesn't sound like it. I mean, like, I think Tennessee will make a call, but, you know, I, he wanted to stay out home for a reason. And I know he's got some predictions to UCLA since he decommitted, um, but uh, that one just doesn't feel like, you know, I know he plays for Casey, but that one distance, just don't feel it. Yeah, distance feels like that's a factor there. And, and you know, sometimes you just can't overcome the distance issues. And I, I think I think that's a long trip for him that, that he has a harder time with, which is Nico, the quarterback, doesn't seem to be bothered by the distance. And he's made that trip multiple times. Uh, I think with Ephesians, distance is a, ha- a heavy factor there. All right, Loud Noises has got some uh, coaching carousel questions. Um, this has been the craziest coaching, sell, coaching carousel ever, right? Can you think of a year that even comes close? Um, do you care to speculate on any of the remaining dominoes? Um, like, will Venables land in Oklahoma if that falls through? Do they pivot to Mark Stoops? Will Manny Diaz be out once they hire an AD? If so, will they ha- target Kiffin, et cetera, et cetera? All right, let's go. Let's go to start. Rob, to me, this is the craziest carousel because you've had two coaches leave two major programs to go to other programs, which you don't see happen very often. Well, think about. It. I mean, you've had three national champion programs in this century in USC, Oklahoma, and LSU. Multiple national championships in LSU, and then Notre Dame, the historically probably, you know, most prestigious program of all time in college football all four four of those jobs came open you know and, and had people move I don't Brian Kelly I read this somewhere is the only coach who has ever left a program in a year where he won 11 games and he did and that was when he went from Cincinnati to Notre Dame and now he's done it twice uh that's it, it's it's remarkable just because of the power programs that they're all looking for you know we've had this many openings before but never a, these quality of programs well and you've never had guys this many quality at quality stable programs where the coach leaves on his own he didn't get fired you know i mean you've had major moves where guys got fired now dan mullen got fired we know ed orgeron got fired but i mean oklahoma's not had a winning successful coach who they want to keep leave notre dame has not had that 1947 is the last time oklahoma had a coach leave that on his own. That wasn't fired. nineteen. I, I just happened to read an article. Or, 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 I mean, Bob Stoops retired. He didn't get run off. In, in 1908 for Notre Dame. <laughs> That's crazy. All right. Venables to Oklahoma. I don't know. I don't know what Oklahoma. What, what I, that would not excite me at all if I'm Oklahoma. I mean, I'm not saying it might be a great hire. Depends on who his OC is. I just don't see how you go from somebody like Lincoln Riley, you know, a quarterback whisperer who's had two Heisman Trophy winners two number one draft picks at that position and, and hire a defensive guy. Yeah, I, I see some Oklahoma people trying to talk up Matt Rule and Joe Brady. I don't know that either, you know, is that going to happen in the NFL? I mean, if that's Whoever the goes backwards. Yeah, it's, it's hard to see, but we'll see what happens there. I think Manny Diaz is safe until they hire an AD. Uh, then I guess all bets are off, but depending on when that AD hire makes place, takes place, it would seem to think that Manny Diaz is probably safe because I don't think that they're going to have an AD in place probably until after Christmas, you know. Um, now, could you get into January and that AD do an evaluation and decide to make a change? I guess that's possible, but that would seem uh, less likely to me, but we'll see. Um, we seem to be hitting the part of the carousel where more coordinators are being mentioned for jobs other than Venables and Levy or any other hot names out there. Yeah, I don't know what Duke's going to do. I mean, I think that's going to probably be a coordinator hire. We'll see. Tim Banks has been mentioned there, you know. Um, but don't you think if Tony Elliott can get that job, he goes there? I mean, like if I'm Tony he Elliott, such I a do. bloodbath at Clemson. Yeah, if I'm Tony Elliott, I'm on the. I think I'm on the move because my 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 star. I got a quarterback that I had a hard time getting anything out of this year. I, you know, they're going to be on me at Clemson if we're not any better next year. Uh, and I, I don't have my pick of jobs the way I did a year ago. I'm not necessarily what, I mean, pick, but I'm not in he, as many. If he ends up at Duke, will that not be one of the worst like career choices, you know, that anybody's ever made when he could have been? I mean, I'm not saying he would have won here, but this is this job is a million times better than the Duke job. Yeah, and he might turn Duke down. I mean, he might. I mean, he's making 2.5 million or whatever at Clemson, but he is creating some unrest and some realistic expectations for some significant pr- improvement uh, a year from now at Clemson. So, you, you know, th- does he want to take that chance on it not being any better next year? Because if it's not any better next year, 
then he's not getting any, he's not getting interviews with anybody next year. And he's only you know only Duke's the only place I've seen his name mentioned when this he's, year. And he's in good chance he gets fired. Yeah, because so. pressure, he, I mean, Dabo spoiled those people. I mean, he will be on. Yeah, I mean, he will be on Dabo, but it'll be on them to not be eight and four or nine yeah. and three. Uh, so we'll see. Plenty of carousel uh, revolving to continue over the course of the next few days. Um, hard hat ball. What super seniors do we expect are likely coming back besides Carvin? Assume they were now. I assume they will now count against the eighty-five, but we probably have room. They will count against the eighty-five. Um, Austin, the biggest one is Hendon Hooker. You feel like Tennessee's in a pretty good sh- shape to get back there. Um, I was, you know, we'll see. Some of these guys went through the senior day ceremonies. Who could come back? Do they change their mind and elect to come back? Do they elect to move on? You know, I think Carvin and Hooker are the two most important. Yeah, I agree. I think those are the most important guys to, to get back. Uh, you know, Carvin coming back means you got four of your five starting O line back. Can you replace K to right tackle? And then obviously Hendon Hooker is the one that drives the train. So I, I think Calvert's going to come back for talking to some people. Which yeah, will be we'll, yeah, we'll we'll see what we'll see what happens with him. I was surprised he went through the through the ceremonies for senior day um, as a senior. So. I think he's always got to continue to look at his health from a health standpoint. Does he want to continue to go? He's never been able to stay healthy through a season. Um, you know, what do you think about Bumpus, AP? Yeah, he's definitely that, back. Yeah, and I think that's a big gift for Tennessee. I mean, I, that's I think that's never that, played that's, the last eight weeks or whatever. Yeah, that's why he's redshirted. And I, I think that one's, I think that's solid for Tennessee to get back. Um, I'm not going to compare it to staggering Travis Stevens being a senior later because. T- impact two totally different things but similar in the way that was staggered like they could have let bump play the season out and he would have played a handful of snaps or well, he played more than a handful of snaps but point being he would have been a you know played a marginal role instead now he comes back and he'll be the elder statesman on the defensive line if he can stay healthy yep all right uh i heart balls wants a con- wants us to comment on question number two in this guy's tweet um this is Aaron Torres' tweet. In the modern era of college football where OU is an SEC school, is it really a better job than UT? I say no. No. It's it's the same, in my opinion. I mean – I think it's got more fertile think- recruiting ground closer by with Texas. There's a bigger but, pool there nearby because Texas and Texas A&M can't take all of them. And Oklahoma has a long tradition of mining that area i mean it's not like they're carpet baggers just coming in there i mean they've been doing that for decades they have relationships but facilities wise it's not where it needs to be in my opinion no but you know what i I think georgia is almost as good as the state of texas when it comes to bodies i mean look how many quality bodies come out there every year going to places not named uga i mean like georgia can get their pick of the best in that state and still you've got kids and kids and kids that come out of that state that are really good players so you know, I, I feel like Tennessee's not too far from the same type of fertile recruiting ground in Georgia. And I would argue, May, that Tennessee, I mean, here, based on the last five years, and I think it's only getting better, it might be better in-state talent. Yes. There's a reason Oklahoma keeps trying to come over here and recruit it. Yeah, that's, you know, and it's center. I mean, Oklahoma was bad before Bob Stoops rolled into town. I mean, he got it rolling, you know, but it's, I mean, they had some really bad days. It's not like, I mean, they've had great tradition. Don't get me wrong. I mean, going back to, um, you know, running the wishbone and everything. But there was a stretch there where Oklahoma was not a very good team and Bob Stoops got that fix. So, um, you know, they can be as good as as good as their coach takes them to, as Bob Stoops is certainly. But, but winning in the SEC will be different than winning in the Big 12. Their challenge is there week in and week out. They think they're ready for, they're not really ready for, in my opinion. I mean, I, I think that you got to, you know, it's a different understanding once you play through it and see, what each and every week is like in this league, really all year yeah, talk, long. When you talk, talk about to me, center fans, after you get them playing number one, number two, and number nine in a four week stretch. Yeah, because that's never coming, done it before. Right. And that, but that is coming for them. For and sure. that's called October in the SEC. <laughs> exactly. Um, Iron Ball's got some portal questions here. We'll try to sort through some of these. Just another one of the million portal questions. Any speculation on mutual interest between Pierce Quick and Kane Patterson? I don't see Kane Patterson at all. I think he's going to join his brother. Would make sense for him to join his brother uh, at Vanderbilt, um, and, and I think that's where he he's going to end up going. 
Um, I, I don't know about quick. I've not heard anything with Tennessee and quick, but I'll say this, Austin. I fully believe Tennessee is evaluating every offensive line, every offensive tackle body that goes into the portal. The kid from FIU went in this week that Auburn's on. Uh, there's a kid from Louisiana Monroe that went in today or, or earlier this week that Virginia and some other schools have gotten on. I think Tennessee's evaluating all of those kids, uh, and, and we'll see what that ends up looking like. Um, e. Schaefer, 92, assuming Tillman stays, who do you see stepping up in the wide receiver two and three spots? Which 22 freshman wide receiver will have the best shot to contribute next year? Hmm. Good question. You know, uh, I, call me crazy, but I'm going to go with Nimrod. I, there's something about the kid. I, I, I just I, – I don't know what it is. There's something about Nimrod that yeah, I just have the same feeling like Palmer, you know, and even Cedric Tillman. You know, he's, he's, a, he's, he's bigger. When he gets in the college weight room, that's going to matter, and he runs pretty well. And, um, you know, maybe right away I would probably actually take – Squirrel White, but long term, I think Nimrod. Rob, don't you think the biggest challenge is finding that slot receiver? Because th look, th this wide receiver, this offense in the passing game certainly evolved with Hendon Hooker becoming the starting quarterback, but it got better when Bayless Jones went to the slot full time. I mean, that, I, that's, I mean, it, you got to have the right guy at that position. I mean, assuming he's here, I mean, is it not Jimmy Callaway? Does he not look perfect? It should be to me. I mean, it's, you know, the opportunity is certainly there for him. Uh, in that slot spot. And then you could take a freshman and, and play him, play him outside. And it might be Nimrod because of his speed and, and because of his, his size. Um, but somebody's got to fill that void in the slot. They, they've got to find that answer in the slot position. Um, Volunteer to 87. Um, wanted to know about Squirrel White. We've already talked about him, but he's got another question regarding the portal. How is a coach assigned to a kid? Obviously, if Auburn finished second to his original recruitment, you might stick Rodney Garner on him due to prior relationship. But assuming there's little connection to this original recruit, does the position coach lead the transfer recruiting, or is that handled differently? Also, I think it has to be the position coach. Because yeah, because they're older. Yeah. yeah, it's older and it's more spot recruiting. You know, and, and they want to know how they're going to be used more. So, I mean, because they're they're going to play immediately. Yeah, like Jameer Gibbs, like you know. Rodney Garner may have recruited him out of high school, and that may help Tennessee get their foot in the door. But ultimately, Jerry Mack's the one that he's going to play for and, and, and has to talk to. So, like, you know, I think it's more spot recruiting. Um, you know, what was his other question? Just about squirrel wide, if you thought he would be in the class. Gotcha. And yeah, we, we've talked about that. I, I think you have to use – I think you have to use the position coach uh, more heavily in transfer recruiting because those kids are just asking a different set of questions than high school kids did because, because they're looking at things through a different lens than they were whenever they signed coming out of high school or, or how high school kids are looking at it now. And that's well, and just, just the way it is. And Hubbard, don't you think also you're not dealing with the high school coach, whereas, you know, say Rodney has known, probably known the coach at Dalton, Georgia for 20 years. And that's not part of the equation. When you're it, talking about right. a in, in some cases, it might be because the kid's got a really good relationship yeah. with his high school coach. But not, in, in a lot of cases, you're right. It's a different element and a different person. Are the kids making his own independent decision uh, because he doesn't need the guidance he needed the first time around because he understands how it went and, and, and knows what he's looking for after having been somewhere. Um, so I just think it's a different type of recruitment. Um, all right, Pine Mountain Vol wants to know uh, who gets your most underrated player award for the season on offense and defense and the player who has had the best season that went under the radar. Who's the player that had the best season that went under the radar? So who gets your underrated player awards on both sides of the ball? Uh, underrated player? I'll go with Darnell Wright. I was going to say Cooper. I think he's held up pretty well. Yep. But, he, but he's, he's also missed a lot of time. I, I just say Darnell based on the fact that nobody talked about him all year. He didn't give up sacks. He didn't have a bunch of false starts or, or holding penalties. No one talked about him. He, he just quietly went out and did his thing. And if you know Darnell, that's pretty much Darnell doing it, doing his way quietly. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a guy who you're exactly right. Another one I would throw in there 
is I would throw both the tight ends, Fant and Warren, in there. That's a good one. Because I thought – now, I had low expectations. I know, Austin, you thought they were better fits and, and you had a better – you had a higher expectation for those guys. But, but I, I thought both those guys, not only as pass catchers, but were pretty solid blockers this year and, and took a pretty nice step forward. So I would put them in there in, the, in that offensive category as the, well defend, as right. Defensively, uh, I, this is a cop-out answer. I'm going to go Tim Banks because I, I thought he was – uh, he, to me, was the greatest question mark coming into the year. And with what he had to work with, you know, how, how they how they performed pretty much all year, I, I was I was impressed. Yeah. I think DeJon Terry was kind of under the radar pretty good. Yeah, I thought he got better. Um, I thought he and Omari Thomas both got a lot better the back half of the season, quietly had pretty solid years from where the expectations were from them. I mean, Omari Thomas – you know, nobody saw him being a, a starter based on where he was in, in August, and he ended up being that. And, and I agree with you. I, I thought Terry started to, to do some things and was much more active the back half uh, of the season. So was Roman Harrison. You know, that's a guy who, who did some things. But I, I still think Rodney Garner is looking for consistency out of all of those. But it's got to be a defensive lineman who comes into that category because they, they didn't play enough people at linebacker, and they didn't play anybody other than the starters in the secondary. No, there's nobody underrated in the back seven. Yeah, at all. I mean, Alante had a, had a really nice year, but he was expected. And after that, yeah, I mean, you can't call Alante underrated. And after that, I don't, I don't know that you would say anybody was much better than average. Yeah. All right. Last question, and we're out the gate here on the Mailbag Podcast. Florida is increasing their recruiting part, department. How do we stack up compared to uh, Alabama, Georgia, LSU, Florida? I think, Austin, when, when you talk about next phases in terms of – I mean, right now you got you got analysts, you got coaches who have coaches who work under them, you know, in terms of assistant coaches. Recruiting departments are big, but I think there's a little bit of shift in kind of what you're going to need in recruiting departments. You, you've got to have somebody – you've got to have enough bodies who can evaluate the transfer portal. I mean, look at the number of guys who are going in daily right now. I mean, somebody's got to be breaking that film down because you can't have – your position coach looking at everybody who jumps in the portal. So you got to increase it there. And then from the creativity department, there, the rules are being relaxed on what schools can do with recruits. You have to adapt to that as well, right? Yeah. You, to me, like the arms race is going to be like how many creatives can you hire for videos, photos, all that stuff, because now schools can do videos, whereas before they couldn't. Now they can do a kid's commitment video if they want to. And so – um, you know, I, I do think it's a bit of an arms race. I think from just pure scouting, you know, what Tennessee has and Brandon Lawson has in Trey Johnson has in Scott Altizer has in even a young guy like Charlie high is really pretty solid. I mean, I, you know, I mean, all as experienced as there is. Um, and he's done all the in-state type stuff, but then you got Trey Johnson, who I think's a rising star, you know, Brandon Lawson's, you know, ran his shop at multiple places now. And then again, I think Charlie's only going to get better. He's just young. So, um, you know, I think Tussie's really, really good uh, in, in that in that area. Now, I, how does it compare to others? I don't know because I don't deal with those other schools. I don't know, you know, I don't talk to the guys that are watching tape at Florida or or at other schools. And then you have then you have the NIL equation, which is is a whole other factor in there that everybody has to look at, just from a management standpoint, right? Um, so. All of that is, is, is going to be, you know, going to be something to see. I mean, Rob, we, I don't know if you saw the, the tweet on, on Wednesday afternoon. I mean, looks like Texas is creating their own side company. Um, some Texas donors are creating their own side company. They're, they're starting it with $10 million to get rolling in, in NIL money um, out there to go. And so you just – athletic departments can't put it all together, but there's a management factor that, that has to be in there to make sure – <laughs> you know what, what what's going on that's that 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 wild wild west out there is is See, that's, just getting I mean, started that, that's such a gray area because i mean anybody with a look of sense knows that nil stuff is being discussed between recruits and and, and schools i don't know if it's whether it's the position coach or somebody in the recruiting office or whatever i mean it's they, they are being made aware of what opportunities are out there and i'm sure more than certain in some cases they're going to the kids are being told hey if you come here here's what you're going to get well and i mean 
standpoint. And, and what they announced was that they've got $10 million in pledges. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and that's all great. Like, it's like going to the local church and they, they want to build a new, you know, youth building and, and they need $250,000 worth of pledges. They get it, but then all of a sudden people only give 180000 Yeah, see, I, know? I, I've, I've talked to some people who think that some promises that have been made are going to, they're going to be surprised that they're kept. I mean, I'm not saying that, that that's not, they're not getting the $10 million. I'm just saying like, you got to remember the word pledges, you know, mm-hmm. it, if, if they said, Hey, we got $10 million in an account right now. That's different than $10 million in pledges. No, no, I totally agree with you. I, I think the, the, if you're an athletic administrator, I think the scariest thing out there right now is the fact that everybody seems to be playing with monopoly money. And, and at some point, there's got to be some real money, right? I mean, 10-year deals for co- for college coaches, guaranteed. Buying them a house, I mean, a $6 million house. Right. I mean, just some of the stuff that's out there, it's, it, it is. It's crazy. It's like monopoly money. And I know there's a lot of places and there's donors at a lot of places that have a lot of money, you know, but you know this as well as I do. Those people who have money want to make more money, okay? That's, how, that's why they have the money that they have. So get burned on something. You know, and if they, if somebody's getting, is involved in all this, do they have too much power? I mean, there's just a lot of things. Which is why we're raising the, the fee for the uh, private email um, to, uh, to. 12 uh, this month. <laughs> no, no, that's, no, that's, no, the private email is going up 30. <laughs> you better have some juicy nuggets. And, and, for and, that and, and to get, and, and, to, and to get the, to get the meet and greet with Eric Kane and Ben McKee, <laughs> you have to give them 40. Here's what, uh, here's what we're going to do, AP. We're going to take out. We're going to take out your golf privileges and, and people are just going to have to give money instead of giving you golf privileges. How about that? <laughs> hey, <I'll remember. laughs> this is a PG, PG last, podcast. Let's not, go let's ahead. not make it NC-17. Last, last, last thing, Hubbard, on the point you were making about the money and the power, say, you know, like the story, like the three boosters at Michigan State that gave the money for Mel Tucker's extension and raise. I mean, what if those three guys – Three years in, they don't like what they see and they want to fire him. Are they able to just tell the athletic director, hey, pull the plug, we're, we're done? I would say the athletic director would go, if you're writing that check, we'll have that conversation. Are you going to pay Are you going to pay the guaranteed money that you promised up front as a part of that buyout? Because I'm not funding that buyout. That, those are the crazy part. I mean, again, it's just stupid money that's going on out there. So we'll see how it unfolds moving forward. And uh, obviously recruiting and, and everything else is on the forefront. We'll continue to track all of that at VolQuest. That's going to do it for this edition of the Mailbag Podcast presented by Smoky Mountain Organics. For Rob Lewis and Austin Price, I'm Brent Hubs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of your Thursday, everybody. You've been listening to the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast every week right here on VolQuest. Quest.